master gardener now. Um, just became one last year. I want to start off by saying I'm kind of new to seed saving. I'm learning, <clears throat> learning as we go. So um, there could be questions that come up I don't know the answer to. As we were just discussing, you can email them and uh, we will answer them later. Okay, so I'm gonna start my little PowerPoint now, do a share screen. And here we go. How's that looking? Looks great. Okay. Slideshow. All right, title page. Um, so this is, there's a lot of information about this and I'm gonna start off saying, this is an overview, not in depth. Um, hopefully it will get you an idea of what questions you need to start thinking about where you can find some answers. So you should be planning to spend some more time researching for your specific desires. Um, there's going to be a bunch of resources at the end, and I'm going to make a handout um, of what's printed on the slides. So you might want to take notes because I'll be saying some extra stuff. Um, what else? Oh, I also wanted to add that um, this is going to be largely focused on planning your garden if you want to do seed saving, but I'm also going to throw in just sort of general planning um, ideas. Okay, so if you want to learn more, do more research, I want to do a plug for the urban farm. And this afternoon, they're doing Seed Up Saturday, and they do great educational stuff on there. And oftentimes you have to pay for it. So this is free. If you can make it, I highly, highly recommend it. Okay, so as I just said, if you want to be successful in plant, especially for seeds, you should uh, educate yourself more. The Seed Garden book here is amazing and it has general stuff at the beginning and then it has instructions for every plant you would want to grow, every vegetable. Um, it has a lot of detail. It goes into things like hybrids and isolation and um, selecting for traits, but really you can make gardening for seed really simple. Um, and of course, it's always recommended to start simple. Um, I started by collecting seeds from flowers. Like I would go to City Park and see that their columbines had seeds on them and I put them in a little bag. Um, so that can be easier, easier to see when they're ready. So in a lot of ways, you probably already are a seed saver. If you let your plants grow to seed and let them fall on the ground and grow some more, you're a seed saver. So that's like the simplest form. Why save seeds? Seeds are just amazing little things. Um, I'm blown away every time something germinates and to think like out of that comes a plant that's the same every time, all that information packed in there and they last so long and all that stuff. Um, when you save seeds, your seeds are going to adapt to local conditions. And this can happen very quickly through epigenetics. Um, you can also select for traits you like. Say you have, uh, you want to have tomatoes that come in really early, pick that first tomato. Um, you want to have something that grows really tall, pick their seeds from the tallest plant and so on. Um, you can preserve heirloom varieties and biodiversity. You might um, come across a variety that you really love and you can't, you know, a friend has it and you can't get it online anymore. Um, so you can ask them to grow seed for you. It can be cheaper, but you gotta factor in um, 
you're going to spend time and money doing it. So um, that can make it sort of expensive in other ways, like how much time do you have to spend? Um, if a lot, you know, last year, COVID made there be lots of seed shortages. So if there are people contributing to the seed library, we can overcome seed shortages and have a shorter local supply chain. And then it's interesting and educational for kids. They'll be like all set up for their next science project. So quick run through of what seed saving actually involves. Um, and first with processing, there's two kinds of processing. There's dry processing and wet processing. So these species, arugula, beans, lettuce, um, like you see, you know, you see a bean dry on the vine, you see your uh, parsley or arugula go to seed and it dries on the plant. Um, you can also harvest them in a whole plant, let them hang, let them dry. If you do dry process, you're gonna get into threshing, which is just breaking the pods open. You can do it with your hand or a rolling pin. If they're really, really hard, some people drive cars over them. Um, screening is to separate the chaff from the seeds. Basically, you wanna remove chaff because it can have a, it can carry disease. It could be insect seeds in there and it can make it cumbersome to plant if you've got a lot of gunk in there. Um, it's not entirely necessary. You can not do it perfectly or go without it. You just gotta be careful. Uh, you might have a risk of some disease. Really be careful that it's thoroughly dry. Winnowing is a way of also getting the chaff off where you, um, you have your seed and chaff in a little bowl and you toss it up and this is the old fashioned way, you toss it up in the air and all the chaff blows away in the wind and the seeds fall back down because they're heavier. Um, there's other ways of doing it. You can winnow with water. Uh, I sometimes use static electricity. Um, if you run a plastic thing over, it'll take up all the chaff before it takes the seeds. So there's a lot of ways to do that. And um, it doesn't have to be time consuming. Um, so fleshy fruit, you do a wet process. Um, basically you take the seeds out and soak them in water and get all the pulp off. like. If you've ever uh, made pumpkin seeds for roasting, that's the same thing. You just get all that pulp off. Um, some plants have seeds that are embedded into the flesh, like eggplant, watermelon, tomatillo. Eggplant in particular is hard to get the seeds out. Sometimes you have to use a blender or a food processor. Um, you can use dough hooks in your uh, food processor or mixer. It helps not to chop the seeds up. Some seeds benefit from fermentation where you put them in a little glass cup and let them sit for a while, a little slurry, and you'll see a little mold grow on top and that's good stuff. It will um, break down the little um, capsule that's around the seed so it, it's easier to germinate and it will kill off some disease and tomatoes and cucumbers, it's a really highly recommended. Okay, when you're drying, this is very important that you dry it because mold is going to cause problems in your plants. Um, cool, dark place, if you have it in a hot place, it's gonna sterilize the seed, um, get some good air circulation. Some people use a fan. Letting them rest on coffee filters works a lot better than paper towels. They tend to get moldy on paper towels. 
And like I said, you can pick the whole plants and hang them in, until dry and uh, then do your threshing from there. Now this really, when to harvest is something that really applies to garden planning um, because you might have to leave something longer. It's good to do successive harvesting. So you go out one day and you notice some seeds are, are ready to be harvested and you harvest those and you go out two weeks later and there's some that are dark and dry and brown and ready to go. Um, because the seeds are just at ripeness and not sitting out in the sun, they have better quality and less chance of disease. Okay, big concept, market maturity versus botanical maturity. When you eat a tomato, the, the point at which you eat a tomato where it's ripe is the same as botanical maturity, meaning its seeds are ripe, they can be dried, planted, germinated, they're great. Melons too. Peppers, you like say you're growing Pueblo chilies and you wanna collect seed for that. You have to wait till that pepper gets ripe. So it has to, you don't pick it green like we normally would for cooking. You wait till it gets red. Um, you can, you should bring it in and not let it dry on the plant because it'll tend to rot. Cucumber, zucchini, eggplant, winter squash, they are very immature botanically when you eat them. So you have to let them sit on the vine. They will change color, they will get bigger. Um, and you know all of these details about what to watch for for seed maturity, you can find that in, research, in the resources that I'll be listing you can find more specific information for your, uh, for your crop that you wanna grow. And don't let them rot. Rotting will cause problems with and disease with your plant. Um, so for dry seeds, you also have market maturity versus botanical maturity, but that's more- May I so ask a question? Yeah. Um, about the don't let them rot Thing. Um, yeah. Do you mean don't let them mold? Because I thought that rotting is what we are looking for when we're doing the fermentation in a glass. Oh, don't leave them on the vine in the garden and let them rot into the soil. It's uh, better to take them it. when they're mature. Um, and but then, we can still let them rot in a controlled environment? Exactly. Ah, yeah. I see. Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, market maturity of a bean, for example, is when it's green, a green bean. But botanical maturity is you would let it go all the way to dry. And I know if you've ever missed harvesting a bean, you know it gets uh, paler, the seeds start to swell up, um, and eventually it'll just start drying. So that's what you would look for. Um, in like herb seeds, like dill gets uh, dark, the shape changes, gets hard. Color is a major indicator. Um, then you wanna watch out for shattering. That can happen a lot with like arugula or uh, lettuce um, where the seed, as it gets ripe, a lot of times, as soon as it gets ripe, the pod breaks open and the seeds just spurt out everywhere. So a way to deal with that so you can let your seeds ripen on the plant and not lose them is to put a little bag around them, a little mesh bag, which you can buy. They're called blossom bags, or you could make your own. I used to make my own. Um, so there's some that are best dried on the plant and corn must dry on the plant. And that's something when you're planning for seed, a seed garden, you need to start, you might need to start earlier than you would normally do because that corn is gonna take three weeks after when it's market mature. You know, after this, the sweet corn is ready to eat, you'll wait three weeks for it to 
uh, dry out and you don't wanna end up hitting a frost and losing everything. Okay, so start, oh, this is a blossom bag. Um, so what makes a seed crop easy? Um, let's see. Yeah. It's interesting that that blossom bag almost looks like one of those paint bags, the paint sifter bags I can buy at Lowe's. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Didn't you they're, say you had a source for cheap? Is that what you were talking about? Yeah. You go to yeah. Lowe's and they're, they fit in a five-gallon bucket and you pour paint into it to sift out the sediments and impurity, ah. or, you know, dirt and whatnot. That's what I use for making jelly. Oh, yeah. Great. So what makes a seed crop easy? Uh, things that dry on the plant, that it's easy to spot when it's mature. Um, things that don't require a lot of extra space. And the processing is easy. What makes a seed crop moderately difficult is you have having to wait for seed maturity can be tricky at first, maybe figuring out when that's right. Um, isolation is a thing that happens. Um, there can be cross-pollination between varieties. And so if you're trying to really get your seed true, like to, your seed germinates, it gives the same type of plant, the same type of fruit as what you started with. You, People often uh, use isolation. With, they can do that with distance. You can use the blossom bags for isolation also. They do hand pollination. So it's, a, it's extra work and extra planning, extra space. What makes a seed crop very difficult, difficult is often vernalization, which happens with biennials. First season they come up, your carrot, for example, the root's good and you're gonna eat that carrot. If you want to save for seed, you have to leave that carrot in the ground, which is called in overwintering in the ground. And if it survives, I have a question about. That. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, so I got a, um, a bag of carrots from like the food pantry or somewhere. I forget where it was. And I, let uh -huh. it, and I put them in my back of my house. And now that I remembered that I have these carrots in the back, <laughs> in the back of my house, um, I've noticed that they've started growing, the tops have started growing. So I'm yeah. wondering if I can plant them in the ground and they will you produce can. seed. You can. And mm. many things Ooh. will not overwinter in our climate. And one time I got some beets and they were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So mm. what you do in that case is, if they're, if they're gonna die because the ground gets too cold because of freeze, which can happen here, um, you pull them up when they're carrot roots, when they're beets, um, and you put them in storage. You trim off the top and you just put them in a basket, put them in your garage, put them somewhere dark and cool and leave them there for until spring. And um, this vernalization also means that the crop is exposed to winter conditions. A freeze will help it go into reproductive phase the next season. So the biennial, like you're just talking about the carrot, you harvest that carrot, uh, you could try leaving some in the ground and see if they come up and sprout seeds the next season. Or you could do what you did and just pick them up. Usually when you're doing that, you harvest them a little bit before eating time, especially with beets, I believe. Um, and you trim them up and put them in storage and plant them in the spring. Um, also, another thing that makes a seed crop difficult is called photoperiodism. And uh, that it's actually more like night length sensitivity some plants need a certain amount of time of darkness um, for them to go into reproductive phase. So 
long, long nights are earlier in the year. So it's similar to vernalization. They are experiencing winter and that makes them know seasons changing this season, we're gonna make seeds. So those are some of the more complicated concepts. Um, but here is just where you can start, start off with some easy ones. Um, maybe move to moderate. I would really do some reading if you're gonna get into the difficult stuff. Um, that book that I mentioned, it has incredible details on how to deal with um, things that need vernalization. So what should you grow? Obviously what you like to eat, but there's some things that I don't like to eat that I grow just because they're interesting, like garlic. Um, you can consider planting to grow for a grow and give program. And if you go to their site, they will describe to you what crops they like best. Sometimes they don't like to get a lot of eggplant because it's not the best thing to donate. Um, so in that program, you grow up anything extra, you can, they will help you to donate it um, to community resources. You also might want to check with the seed library if you're thinking of growing for seeds and see what we need. Um, we really want to start making our seed library sustainable. We've been purchasing seeds, uh, especially to give out during COVID. Um, and we would like to bring that down to a minimum. So we will, we're going to be trying to let people know what kind of seeds we need. You also, especially if growing seeds, you should consider planting pollinators. Um, lots of plants require sort of more than one fertilization for a nice, big, healthy fruit to appear. Um, you can also plant companions, and there's tons of information on that. It's basically some plants go together uh, for, you can use it for space reasons, for shade reasons, like if you want to grow a little lettuce underneath your tomatoes. So that, is that on the list? Yeah. Other things are companions because they help to discourage pests in their companion. Um, and there are some things that are also not so good companions. So that chart is available at that link that you have there? Um, the chart is actually a different link. Um, I'll oh. put it in the handout. Um, okay. the, the, the link that's there is uh, more, you know, less uh, nice pictures. It's more detailed um, and all, all just text, but it's got tons of information. So start with something simple. Maybe restrict the, the different things you're gonna grow. Like maybe you don't wanna grow all different kinds of crops, just stick to beans and corn and tomatoes. Um, read about the crops you're interested in because you might be reading and discover, oh, it's not gonna grow well in our climate or gee, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, you should look for heat, drought and disease resistant varieties. For seeds, you want to limit your varieties. And that has to do with what I was talking about before about cross-pollination. If you don't want to get into a lot of isolation, if you limit your varieties, just grow one variety of tomato, then you're not going to get that cross-pollination with another plant, which will give you some completely different type of tomato. If you want to stay true to the variety, it's helpful to limit your varieties. Um, for seeds, there's a concept called open pollinated versus hybrids. Hybrids are crosses that tend to not breed true. So, and hybrids can do this very extremely. Like you can plant your hybrid tomato and you harvest it, you plant the seeds from that tomato and it'll come up with like one that has teeny tiny tomatoes that are very bitter and what, you know, it's, 
it can taste completely different. So you should avoid them, basically. You can, if you're very good at this, you can work to take a hybrid and over a couple seasons, get it to be a stable version. Um, but that's, that's complicated and that gets into genetic selection and all this stuff that if you wanna do it, if you like science, go for it. Um, um, so yes. Mike, Dr. Mike Bartolo has developed this thing called a primrose pepper and uh -huh. it's, he's gonna be introducing it this year and it's a Pueblo chili <laughs> that is so hot that he's, <laughs> <laughs> that it's only, basically they're recommending it only be used for, de uh, in, uh, what do you call it, decorative purposes. Oh my God. <laughs> so that is a perfect example of what you're talking about right now. Um, yeah, I, I would like them to develop a variety of Pueblo chili that's a little bit milder. <laughs> <laughs> they are pretty intense. They're hot. Yeah, some of them can be. Yeah. Batch. Um. So. Yeah. Where was I? Open pollinated. Um. Oh, some of the resources at the end are a good place to find open pollinated, organic, non-GMO seeds. Um, Sometimes you can think of it as an issue if you're, you know, with uh, GMO sometimes has genetic patents. It's actually illegal to collect seed from them. The genetic police are not gonna come around and catch you, but sometimes those GMO seeds, they just don't, they don't breed true. Sometimes they don't germinate at all. They tweak them so that you can't collect seeds. Um, so if you want to find open pollinated, if it's an heirloom seed, it's open pollinated. Some will say open pollinated, but they're not heirlooms. But if it says heirloom, you can pretty much guarantee. Um, okay, so seeds also, you might want to consider what seeds do you need? Like you, every year you might plant three kale plants and that's fully fully provides for you of your kale needs. But lettuce, you might grow in succession. You might grow uh, lots of heads. Um, you know, you, you need a lot of seed to grow lettuce. So you looking at that, lettuce could be a very good candidate for you to collect your seeds. Um, this is more general planning your garden. Read about your crops that you want to do and consider what grows well here and what your site is like. Um, these pictures here are things that grow really well in Pueblo, especially in the blaring hot sun. Uh, those are some Afghan tomatoes from Farm Direct Seed. Um, I'm going to grow some Iraqi varieties of tomato this year. Um, because they love the hot and they love the dry. Um, I got them from Penn Parmenter. She's a wonderful seed producer. Uh, so, you know, Pueblo chilies, obviously, all kinds of peppers do well in the sun. And the more sun you get on a pepper, the hotter it's going to be, I've heard. Okra is great here. Eggplant, melons, watermelon. Does the more sun it gets, the sweeter it gets, and corn obviously it's a good one. If also, um, very, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say on the peppers. Also, I've heard that if you um, strain or what is it, strain them with a little bit of you know underwatering, can make them hotter as well. And also screaming and yelling at them. Oh, making angry peppers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It, you know what really gets affected by that is herbs, like herbs grown in sun versus herbs grown in partial shade. They can taste completely different. Um, so it's good to be aware of that. If you have a lot of wind on your property, you might want to consider figuring out how to make some wind barriers. It can get very windy here. Um, corn especially can blow down. Um, so soil properties around here, I don't know, 
I guess there's some areas around here that have sandy soil. Um, my garden, <laughs> my native soil is pretty clay. It gets compacted. Yeah, most of the soil here is clay. If you um, plant direct in that, it's going to basically suffocate your plant because that compacted soil, it hold the clay holds water. Uh, the roots of a plant need oxygen and they, they will not get oxygen under those conditions. So if you're planting a native soil here, you have to add a lot of organic material. And I put this on here, take these things seriously because as I, in my gardening career, I've done things like try to grow pansies in a uh, shaft in my apartment. There's, there's like no light. <laughs> I've done all kinds of stupid things until one day I just realized I have to pay attention to what my plant really needs. I have to be serious about that. Um, and it makes good soil and good conditions make a huge difference in how many insect pests you're going to get, um, diseases, how good the fruit tastes, all that stuff. Okay, now, especially for seeds, considering the space you need, it's gonna be a big, a big part of your planning. You wanna go into, for, for just planning for eating, I call this bang for your buck. Like I, I kind of gave up planting carrots because they take up a lot of real estate as it's called. They take up a lot of your gardening space. And to be honest, you can get really good tasting organic carrots for not that much in the grocery store. So. Well, he, but here's the thing, Christina, mm -hmm. um, you can also grow carrots and in the same exact space, you can grow something else that grows up. There you go. Um, like, is, like, and that's how you you uh, use your companion planting guide exactly. um, to maximize that. So you can actually grow carrots in your garden, but you know, plant them amongst like lettuce or something like that. So that way, you'll have two crops growing at the same time. And that's also not for carrots so much, but that's also a good way to provide the right conditions. Like for lettuce, you got shade from your tomato, and you know how. Lettuce will bolt here. So that's a very good technique. Um, in any case, that decision that I made was, I'm gonna grow tomatoes because they're expensive and you really can't get really super good tasting ones unless you grow them. So that's something you can consider, like what do you like to eat and what is what would you spend too much money on if you bought it in the grocery store? Um, because you want to use your the land that you have as efficiently as possible so that you can get the produce that you want. Um, there's succession planting where you plant uh, for spring and then summer and fall. Um, and that takes a little planning in terms of when the spring is ripe, what you're going to rip out and replace it with and so forth. You can also do sort of all season long harvesting, which involves picking different varieties. Um, so like for seeds, maybe not so good to have varieties, but also if you're doing it all season long, that means that the fruit's gonna be, and the vegetables are gonna be ripe at different times. And that can actually be very helpful for isolation of varieties for getting seeds because the one variety gets your produce ready, you know, in June. And so that's when it's all getting pollinated and fertilized. But the next variety, by the time it does that, the other one has stopped. So that can also help get that isolation so you can get uh, varieties to breed true. Breeding true just means what you plant from the seed, that you got from another plant, it's gonna have the same tasting fruit, the same qualities. Um, population size is something people don't realize sometimes. I had to learn that, that some crops 
you really should have more than one plant. Uh, tomatillos are a big one for that. And it, it doesn't have to do with male and female flowers. They just like to have friends around them. Um, for seeds, you can have a population size can be necessary to maintain genetic diversity so that you have seeds that are better at surviving cold, surviving a frost. You have, um, it tends to keep them from getting inbred, which can cause diseases, susceptibility, um, and you know, poor tasting produce. So when you're doing seeds, you really need to look out for space. Like we talked about the isolation, sometimes you do that by distance. So that's a, you will need to figure out how far away, where can I plant this? Um, sometimes containers are a really good way to get isolation distance if for growing for seeds. Market maturity versus seed maturity. Of course, if you're getting, if you're growing for seed, you're gonna be leaving that plant longer in the ground. So it might be taking up space that normally you would rip out that plant and put in your fall plants. Um, just growing plants for seed can require increased space. The plants, when they're growing to maturity, they get bigger, they need that space. Um, and then there's the, the problem of biennial, biennials and vernalization that we talked about. So in that case, you might be leaving plants in place for a long time till, till the next season. So you would want to plan for that. Um, what was I gonna say about that? I forget. Okay. And this is very important. How much time and money do you wanna spend? Um, especially the time, because if you overextend yourself and you don't have time, you're not gonna be able to take care of your plants and you won't get good results. Okay, so there's been a recent presentation on starting seeds indoors uh, that would be posted on the YouTube site. Um, so that has much more detailed information about how to do it. But as a brief summary, some plants are gonna do better when planted outside. Carrots, corn, uh, lettuce can do better. Any type of greens can do better. Um, but some plants need that extra time of starting early to miss the fall frosts and just so you get an earlier harvest. And particularly in our area, you wanna avoid the strongest heat. So the earlier you plant, the sooner it will start getting flowers and getting pollinated. If it's too hot during pollination, that pollen gets sterilized and they will not set fruit. And that was a big problem last year with tomatoes. A lot of people had that problem. Um, so if you're doing indoors, you should start now for tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and maybe a couple of weeks from now, squash, melon, cucumber. You can plant those from seed outside as well. But um, like something like pumpkin, that's kind of a long season plant. And you'll see on the seed packet, it'll say days to maturity. Um, and keep in mind, if you're planning for seeds, you're planning for seed maturity. So what's gonna be on your seed packet is market maturity. So you wanna allow extra time um, for corn, for example, it can be like three weeks, I think I mentioned. Choose your type of bed. I'm gonna um, highly, highly recommend block growing. Um, you might've seen that. This is, this is a block system um, as opposed to planting in rows. And when you do this, you're putting your plants closer together. Um, so there are some issues like you need to have really good soil and drainage and raised beds work good and you gotta be careful you don't plant too close. Um, but it's a really good way. 
Where am I going? Uh oh. Hang on. Please stand by for technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. So raised beds here and are great. Um, and you know, you won't have to, if you purchase soil, you're not gonna have as much amendment as you would have planting in our ground. Um, so, oh, also if you do direct into the ground, you can sort of create raised beds um, that's what this guy's doing here. He's making paths amongst them. So paths are very important because you don't want to walk on your soil because it's going to get compacted and that will cause similar problems where your roots aren't getting enough oxygen. Don't make your beds too wide. I started a long time ago, I made this big raised bed and it was like nine feet across and um, I couldn't reach in the middle, <laughs> so I had to like put boards on it so I could walk on it. So it's better to start out with something that's like a maximum of four feet across. Um, maybe you want to do containers. Uh, if you don't have a lot of space, containers are a great option. Um, so yeah, block beds, increased yield, reduces weeds because they're closer together. Um, that can also sort of act as a mulch. Um, and there are some some issues, but overall I think block beds are the way to go. You might want to purchase soil. Um, if you are making a whole bunch of raised beds, you'll want to get bulk. I got my bulk last year from Pioneer and it wasn't the best bulk soil I ever got. So I did a lot of amending with it. I added peat moss, I added some fertilizer, and I added some vermiculite to uh, keep it from getting quite so compressed. Um, you will want to keep in mind what mulching you're going to do. Mulching is really important for because of how dry it is here. It also keeps the soil cool, which will help prevent your spinach and lettuce, etc., from bolting going to seed. Um, so mulching, one of the best things is grass clippings. If you are um, not quite environmentally politically correct, you might still have a lawn. And if you don't treat it, save those clippings and use them for mulch. You can ask your neighbors too. Um, so that's a good one. Uh, peat moss is good. Anything green stuff is better so you have like some stuff you've thinned out you can take that green plant matter and just chop it up and put them down dry leaves are good too um, be wary like i said of things that have chemical treatment on them be wary of things that have disease and insects do not mulch with that mulching with straw can be good Sometimes straw will be uh, not weed seed free. So you keep an eye on that. Um, and then you wanna figure out what irrigation you're gonna use. How much water can you afford to use? That might make you decide, I'm not gonna grow that much. Um, drip and soaker hoses work very well for produce. Overhead watering tends to produce disease make disease pass easier, especially powdery mildew. So the benefit of drip and soaker hoses compared to overhead is that they are much more uh, drought friendly. They save you water. So that's a good way to go if you're concerned about the amount of money you're gonna spend on water. So don't plant too close. This is another rule that I've broken many times and uh, trying to learn not to do it. But it is tempting to be like, I wanna put all these plants and I wanna grow these. You grow them too close, they're gonna get sick because there's not enough air circulation. Um, they just, it's so much better when they have enough room. So with seeds, 
We talked about having isolation distance so that the varieties don't cross. Um, this picture here is a picture of my beds where I used, um, I used window screen and hail screen. Hail, the hail mesh you can get uh, at Fox is pretty cheap. I use that to prevent hail and to make a little bit more shade because my garden is out in total direct sun all day. So that can also be used for seed isolation. You can drape it, drape a mesh around that will keep pollinators out. If you're doing that, uh, you're gonna have to hand pollinate for insect pollinated plants. And when you decide what crops you're gonna grow, that's one of the things you'll, if you're growing a crop for seed, that's one of the things you'll look up. Is it wind pollinated? Is it insect pollinated? What's the best way to make sure that your plant gets pollinated well? Um, isolation space can be easily made with containers um, and that will save you your precious raised bed real estate for stuff you're gonna eat. So these are all the resources. There's a more in-depth class about seed saving coming up July 31st. Very well worth watching. Um, some of these sites have, like this one has fine seeds. Oh, an arrow, that's what, that's what works. Uh, so if you're looking to figure out where to get organic open pollinated seeds, um, some of them have, this one has a directory for all different kinds of, for all different places you can buy seeds. Um, these are some good pages for seed savers. We have Seed Save with Bill McDormand and, and Bell Starr are like these incredible seed educating people. And the, the workshop that's coming up this afternoon from two to five, I'm pretty sure Bill McDormand will be doing a, a lecture in that. However, their site has changed recently and it's not quite so useful because it's, I think what has happened is they, they need to get compensated for educating you. So um, they're more to offering classes that you can pay for. Um, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is also Bill McDormand. Um, that can be really interesting to follow on Facebook. They do also a lot of heritage grain trials. You can read about how that works and how they're preserving those heirloom grains. Native Seed Search is awesome. They have all kinds of really great heirloom seeds. And they also have a lot of information about how to grow. And they are uh, Southwest oriented. So they're gonna have plants that will grow very well in our climate. Uh, the Urban Farm, I love. They're the ones who are having this uh, event today, Seed Up Saturday. Um, they have, I, I forget if it's every two weeks or monthly seed saving chats where you can just log on and ask questions of great experts. They have different people coming on all the time. Um, and they have information education on their site. And they also have like major classes, detailed classes that you can sign up for. If you are really into it, you wanna spend the money, um, they're great. And Penn and Cord Parmenter, they, Miss Penn, she grows seeds and they are very oriented towards growing seeds that grow in Colorado, um, especially short season seeds that are good for mountains. Um, and that can be helpful here too, especially if you wanna do timing to harvest all year, you wanna get early crop of a variety. Um, they also, that's where I got my uh, Iraqi tomato seeds, which are really good for hot and dry. So I'm excited about that. 
Um, there's a bunch of fact sheets and of oh, the um, there you go the CMG garden notes. So these are notes that I've listed here that will give you a lot more detail about these things I've been talking about. The, how to do a block style layout is a great one. There's a fact sheet, Saving Seed, which is very good. Um, All Pueblo Grows has a seed saving section and seed donation section. And I want to um, also say that if you're donating to All Pueblo Grows, it says on their donating site, it says that seeds should be cleaned. Um, but if they're reasonably uh, cleaned, not a whole lot of chaff and extra <coughs> leaves and seeds. And especially if they're very dry and you, you're like, I wanna save seed, but it takes so much time to clean them. We'll accept. Uh, yeah, we not. will accept. We will not only accept them, we can also set up a special time to teach you how to do that on the virtual Zoom. I would oh, be great. more than happy to do that for you. Um, and I will, you know, if, if you just don't want to take the time to do the cleaning, I'll do the cleaning myself. But we just <laughs> need your seeds. Please yes. donate your seeds. Don't let that prevent you from donating yeah. seeds. We're doing a thing this year too, where if you grow seed and donate it back, um, you can win, you'll be entered in a raffle to win some mm -hmm. prizes. So we're working on getting those prizes going. It'll be like gift certificates to Fox or Campbell's, stuff like that. Um, Okay, cohorts blog and plant talk are good. They're currently at the top of their uh, of their feed. They have some articles about planting a vegetable garden. Um, Colorado Vegetable Guide has like everything you really need to know for growing vegetables. And these are the garden notes. There's some more garden notes, containers, irrigation, water conservation, and a climate summary. Climate summary has a calendar in there for when to plant different crops in Pueblo. Mm -hmm. It also has on the climate summary, has also a um, kind of a timeline of when to expect the last, or I mean, the, yeah, the last frost of the year. As, all, as well as the first frost of the year, which is very important for timing the planting of your plants. Yes, yes. Oh, and that's the and end. All of these resources.